I am really worried because everybody separates it out into different things. And you've got what's happening with abortion rights in the US. You've got what's happening in education in Afghanistan. You've got what's happening with women being shot uh, for taking off the hijab in Iran. And you have this happening right now in the UK. And all those dots are connected because these are all assaults on women's ability to participate freely in society. And this is how easy these rights can get shut down and women can become very scared and silenced. Hello, welcome back to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Rosie Kay. Rosie, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, your show, so it's lovely to be on. Yeah, really nice to talk to you. Brilliant. Well, we are delighted to have you on. I've wanted you on for quite some time for many reasons. Prime amongst them is that I've often thought that your experience of cancel culture is one of the most interesting and one of the most bizarre and uh, one of the most revealing about this whole climate that we currently find ourselves in. So there's lots of different aspects of this story and things in general I want to talk to you about. But I do want to kick off with the story itself, uh, which I have followed very closely. And um, so people, many of the listeners will know that you are an esteemed choreographer, uh, very well known for the um, dances that you have choreographed over the past few years and for your dance company, uh, the Rosie K Company, which you left last year following an incident at a dinner party in your own house. I mean, we really are getting slightly down into Stasi territory now when people have to leave work because of something they said over dinner. So could you just recap the story for listeners so that they know what we're talking about in relation to this? Uh, so it was August last year. Um, I was only about 10 days away from the premiere of a big, brand new, contemporary, Birmingham-based version of Romeo and Juliet, which I've been working on for about five years and on and off with the very young cast of dancers for about a year. And um, it was a funny vibe in the studio. Um, I picked that up and I wanted to do something sort of to show them that I, I cared. I wanted to invite them into my home. It's something I normally do with dancers. And I think also, you know, my management said it was a good idea because there'd be less of a COVID risk than going out clubbing in Birmingham because we were just in that really difficult Cusp. We had a show, yet COVID rates were rising. You know, there's a lot at stake if I lost um, a Romeo or a Juliet at that point. So I invited them to my house. Um, they, they, I showed them around my house. Uh, they met my son. Um, I cooked them lots of different meals uh, for their different sort of <laughs> needs. Um, and then it was very late in the night. So we're talking like half one, two. My husband had tried to kick everyone out. It was all like very lovey, lovey, as you'd expect with a bunch of loveys. Um, and then, uh, and, and, and I, you know, so I'm in the garden of my own home at sort of one they they're drinking my alcohol, they're helping themselves to my wine collection. I did think I was with, you know, people that, yeah, I could, I could speak to some dancers. They were very young, but I'd known them for quite a long time, some of them. And they asked me what my next show was. And I was just about to put audition notices out for, uh, looking for the main role of Orlando. I was going to do a Virginia Woolf adaptation, which is an incredible, funny, really witty, clever novel where the eponymous hero, who's a bit wet, starts off as a male aristocrat and halfway through transforms to become a woman. And there isn't much done about it, but it's very interesting the way that Virginia Woolf observes how the rest of society treats Orlando. Um, and that then got into a discussion about who could, who could or should or must play that role and I was pretty easy. I, I, I felt like it just needs to be someone extraordinary. But then we got into a discussion around sex and gender and it got quite heated quite quickly. I felt like I, I was the only one that was actually standing up for women's perspective on some of this, like the kind of further repercussions of what some of these things mean. Um, but it just got kind of out of hand. And the more I tried to explain why I thought this could be a danger to women's rights and to children the kind of like worse it got and I, I was really I was genuinely absolutely shocked really shocked mm. at how far down the ideological road they'd gone but to be honest I did think it could get sorted and it would blow over 
But then my board and my management got involved and it just got worse and worse and worse. And I went through two separate investigations. The first one, I was exonerated. Um, We did another load of shows. One of the dancers appealed and then they started bringing in really, really expensive lawyers and HR consultants and um, they, you know, they, they lied, they, they, they weren't honest about what they were doing and I lost complete trust with them. So I, I got two separate legal opinions and, and so I resigned citing constructive dismissal. I mean, there are so many extraordinary aspects to this story, which is why I think it has gripped lots of people's attention over the past year. Um, I think one of them, I want to come on to the fallout and the fact that you eventually had to leave your company. Uh, But in relation to the dinner party itself and why that caused so much offence. So what we're talking about here is you making an argument that many people, myself included, would consider to be entirely rational and um, biologically correct, um, which is that there are men and women and that there could be problems for women if we allow sex to become something that one can choose and one can determine for oneself. And once you've determined that you're a woman, you can go into any area, you can go into any women's uh, private zone, changing rooms, toilets, domestic violence shelters, and so on. So you were making the case, weren't you, that there are potential problems with some of this new campaigning and some of these new ideologies in relation to the role that women play in society and the safety of women in society? Starting out with kind of saying, you know, like pronouns... Yes, they can be the beginning of something, but but when you have a case where a woman has been raped and she's standing up in court and she has to call her rapist a she, you know, mm. of course now that's a Ricky Gervais joke, but at the time it seemed, you know, no no one else was saying this stuff out loud. And 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 I, while I'd, I'd really thought about this, I'd really been following the whole, both the trans rights arguments and the feminist arguments which became sort of gender critical, I, I was I was also coming at it from a you know cultural phenomenon point of view as well. That that's what I do, that's what I look at, is how I make work. So so I actually genuinely was interested in their ideas and how they'd got to those ideas. And then I was really shocked that it was just an absolute shutdown because um mm. I'm a I'm a middle-aged woman and there are certain aspects of my life that are absolutely without doubt shaped by me having a woman's body and to deny that or to say that that isn't important but it's quite offensive to me actually you know I nearly died in childbirth and so did you know my baby and you know I was having to sort of rack up these these you know traumatic stories to say look you know no matter how you feel about yourself no man or male body person is ever going to go through such an extreme experience Mm. you know much I love my husband he'll never go through that experience um these things are important and That's part of the real feminist history and tradition is being able to speak about these things. And for that suddenly to be verboten, I I was just like, oh, come on, this can't be true. This is ridiculous. This is not true. But even by saying that, that was me being incredibly, supposedly disrespectful. I'm used to this pedagogic, you know, cross-generational discussion, particularly in the arts, and to just be shut down and told that I'm not allowed to say these things when actually... That's actually my job to say these things and to look at these things. Yeah. It was really shocking, really shocking. Um, and so talk to me a little bit about their response. I mean, obviously, you don't want to say who they were and you might, might not necessarily want to qu- quote them verbatim or anything. But the general tone of their response in terms of the younger people who were with you when you were making some of these points and having this discussion, was it a, an instant reaction on their part where they couldn't believe you were saying the things you were saying or, or did it take time over the next few days and weeks for that to work itself out? And, and what was what was their general beef with what you were saying, that you were offending them, that you were being transphobic, that you were saying things that they simply couldn't compute given the ideas that they had in their own minds? Yeah, so I think I think at first I felt like I was just I was being provocative and you know and, and come on you know yes there's this side and that side but there's also the real world and then very quickly I was sort of being shouted down so then I was sort of defending and then I think it turned sort of inwards into this kind of you have offended us mm. and so there's those that are offended and then there's those that are allies to the offended and and then that sort of I think that could have been nipped in the bud. I think I was a bit shocked and I was also a little bit kind of um, hamstrung in that, you know, my show's going up in 10 days. If my cast aren't with me, 
I'm, I'm really in trouble. You know, it's a choreographer's worst nightmare um, to sort of lose, you know, there, there's nothing there but an empty space and some people. And so if, if you've lost them, their imaginations, then you're really on trouble. Um, but then, I mean, my lawyer and I, we did do a subject access data request and there certainly was an appetite to make amends. What I've read in from, from emails is that they seem to think I needed re-educated or poor old Rosie. She just doesn't understand that the world's moved on and the, these are the new facts, basically. And then there's a discussion with my chair and my manager about what kind of re-education programme would be suitable, whether it be mermaids or gendered intelligence. And I know about these organisations. Mm. And there's a lucidity where, where the manager says, well, of course, Rosie's better read than most of these trainers would ever be and would run rings around them. So, <laughs> <laughs> Damn right I would. <laughs> um, so, but there was this sort of sense of like, but these ideas of Rosie's are, are so dangerous, we need to sort of mm. put them in the bud. And, and so I think everyone came down on me really heavy in some kind of strange reaction. I mean, I mean, to be honest, at the time, I was absolutely shocked. And I thought everyone had just completely lost their minds. Now I realise it's happening a lot in the arts. It's much worse than I thought. It's really like a new, new religion's come through. Yeah. And I'm sort of surprised at how few artists have, have spoken out, uh, you know, such brilliant, intelligent artists and what everyone agrees or are a lot of people just deliberately staying quiet right now. Hi, this is Fraser here, Deputy Editor of Spiked. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like walking your dog in public without securing them on a lead. Most of the time, you'll probably be fine. But what if one day your dog runs away or gets dog napped? It's always better to be careful, especially when taking precautions is as simple as using ExpressVPN. Did you know that every time you connect to an unencrypted network in cafes, hotels or airports, your online data is not secured? Any hacker on the same network could gain access and steal your personal data. But ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so they can't. It'd take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. ExpressVPN works on all your devices, phone, laptop, tablet, even your smart TV. And it's so easy to use. Just fire up the app and click one button to get protected. And on top of that convenience and security, I can watch content from around the world that I wouldn't normally have access to. For instance, I can watch any country's version of Netflix all that on any device, just one button click away. Get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free at expressvpn.com slash Brendan. That's expressvpn.com slash Brendan. expressvpn.com slash Brendan. Yeah, I think that feeling of it being like a new religion is, is incredibly strong. And um, I don't work in the arts, but when I've spoken on university campuses, on issues like this, or even issues that are not, not even related to the trans question. I'm often greeted by protesters and people who uh, waving signs. And once they held a, a vigil outside the Oxford Union while I was speaking inside, a vigil for all the trans people who had been killed by my journalism. And there's a kind of irrationalism to some of that, where they do start to conceive of words and opinions not only as wrong or contradictory of their own opinions, and that's fine for them to think that, but they think of them as dangerous, as destructive, and as something that could actually harm their physical, mental uh, well-being. And I think that's part of the response that you had. But I want to talk about then how it went up the ladder. Every time I read about your case, I am just struck by how extraordinary it is that someone like you, who founded this company, could in so many ways be thrown under the bus by yeah. some of the people in HR and so on um, to uh, alleviate the pain, the presumed pain or the offence taking of younger dancers. And that really is a testament, I think, to how entrenched this ideology has become in certain sections of the arts, as you say, and, and other parts of the world too. How did that experience feel when you felt like you were being stabbed in the back by some of the people in the company that you yourself founded? Yeah, I, I, I was oh, I was absolutely in shock. I mean, for quite a long time, and it took me quite a bit 
to recover from as well because these were people that had been at my wedding or my child's christening people that had you know stayed at my house for dinner at my house um l- looking back th- there is a, a moment where I stepped down as a director where I ceded the control of the company in order for it to become a charity and un- under English charitable law you can't financially gain from your own charity so um I thought I just had a baby a few years ago. I thought it'd be very nice to have a salary for a little bit and a pension and holiday pay. These are things I hadn't had for 20 years. Um, And I'd lived a bit hand to mouth. So I thought, well, that's the deal I'll do. What I hadn't realised was up until that point, the controversial works I'd made that, you know, I didn't think were particularly controversial, but probably now are a bit controversial. I had shouldered the full weight of responsibility if there was any flack. Um, if there was any sort of like really negative reviews or one time uh, I had a bit of a run in with the MOD around five soldiers way back in 2010. You know, I just saw that as part and parcel of my job and I took it. Once I stepped down and the board became a sort of more professionalised board of trustees, actually, I didn't realise that they were then holding the fragility of the art. And I thought I'd written into the charitable objects, you know, Uh, a dance company that tackles controversial and taboo subjects. Um, Even the most boring financial papers talked about Rosie Kay, you know, tackling in-depth research around subjects that are often not talked about. So, you know, it was written in that I like spotting big trends before they come along. And this clearly is one of the biggest, you know, it's a, a total dismantling of the sex binary you know that that's pretty massive to me and this should be out there and being discussed and being looked at and making art about it I mean it's fascinating whatever side of the fence you sit on with it um so in my first meeting with my chair I just knew straight away it it wasn't good you know it was a bit like being in the headmasters you know and you've done something really really bad and it was kind of like well hang on a minute I am a grown adult and this is my company you know, this is, yeah. you know, Orlando is something I've talked to the board a lot about. You understand my, you know, creative methods. You know that I talk to people, you know that I research. But she did she did admit or, or, or proudly actually tell me that she'd been trained by gendered intelligence and that things have moved on. And I was trying to say, well, hang on a minute. No, no, no. What you're talking about is, is stone law law as they'd like it rather than the law. And I really need you to read um, the Maya Forstarter, Worthy of Respect in a Democratic Society. At that point, she hadn't won her case, but it was worthy to, to go to the tribunal. I was like, you really need to read this and you need to understand that women stating that women are real is in itself classed as transphobia. You know, this is the oxymoron that what they're saying is basically I believe that women are real. That, that, that's it. You know, no, 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 no. We need to investigate this properly and fully. And then I think there was just like a whole load of like um, huddling with the boards and a lot of fear and a lot of reputational fear um, and a lot of control going on in that it wouldn't have gone that far were it not for the current climate that we're in. Yeah. And so I think everybody fears for their own reputations um, and and me rocking the boat was going to upset everything. Yeah. So it was sort of like naughty Rosie, let's tell her off and let's get this company back on track. As opposed to this is actually Rosie K, and this is the Rosie K Dance Company. And what do we do to protect both her and the company? There was, there was no thought of that, and that was again what was very hurtful, very shocking. So there was a moment, I believe, when this was all going on. When I guess there was a fork in the road and you had a choice really you could either accept the slap on the wrists and get back to business as usual and and keep your mouth shut i suppose uh, as uh, women did in the old days um or you could choose to do what you did which is to take the action that you took step down and go public um and then some of the dancers then had the absolute gall to criticize you even for going public about the experience that you had um so Explain a little bit about why you made that decision. It can't have been the easiest decision, or maybe it was an easy decision in terms of standing up for yourself and what you believe in and and your right to speak your mind. What was going through your mind when you made that decision not to accept the reprimand and then to keep your views to yourself, but instead to do something quite radical, which is to 
break out, speak publicly, and put free speech into the discussion about what happens in the arts? Well, I'd, I'd been very, very moved by J.K. Rowling's essay when that came out during during lockdown. And I really felt a call, you know, you, you hit the call, you hear it in your heart, you hear it in your soul. And I'd actually made a solo called Adult Female Dancer during lockdown. It premiered last year. It got fantastic reviews and like award nominations. But even within that solo, I said, being a woman is not in my head. So I think in some respects, I'd already made these public steps mm. to say, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman and I know I'm a woman. And I don't think that's controversial. So I'd kind of already taken steps in those directions. So then for this massive slapdown to come, I think probably even from the beginning, I thought, wait a minute, what on earth is going on? Not on the outset. You know, on the outside, I'm like, okay, I've never had a complaint. I'll do absolutely every due process, investigate me, got it, understand. But probably deep inside of me, you know, I've been making, I mean, I've been dancing since I was three I've been making work for 25 years. I started with solo work. I've had to set up from scratch several times. You know, I've lived in lots of different countries. There's a bit of me that's just like a bit of a survivor, and I know that I'm a survivor. And I wouldn't be in the arts <laughs> if I were there to pitulate and yeah. to just show the party line. And, and it's in my family background. You know, my, my grandfather fled um, well in World War II, they fled the Nazis. You know, this is stuff we talked about at the dinner table. Like, what is freedom? What is freedom? You know, like how important is freedom? Because he didn't return after the Iron Curtain came down. And so our, our family was sort of stranded in Scotland. And that's been part and parcel of growing up. I lived in Berlin. I lived in Poland. I've lived in societies where freedoms are not as assumed as they are in this country. And I think this is the first time mm. we've really felt something like this on, on such a large scale. And, and so there was lots of warning signs. There were lots of things making me go alert, alert, alert. It was very, when it came down to the actual decision, it was very, very difficult. And by then, I mean, I was ill. I was sort of collapsing. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. Um, I was I was being sick a lot. Um, and I, I, I really disagreed with the way that they, they, they'd basically taken the disciplinary and grievance procedure and they'd just thrown it out the window. And that really, really annoys me. Like, good governance. I've been a trustee of different charities. I've been in actually worse situations. And yet you treat people with dignity, with respect. You look through the processes, you do it properly. And there's always an end point. Whereas this, there was just no end point ever. And so I just felt like not only were they throwing out any sort of sense of, of, of good governance, I was not going to be able to carry on working with any of these people and I was not going to be able to make the work that I wanted to make. And so for me, the decision was 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 truly existential. I mean, there's a funny moment where after, I think it was like the week after, the week after I resigned and I found out that the company had folded. I guess that was in order so that I couldn't sue them. And my husband came home, he'd been working in London and he sort of like, he sort of saw me like propped up, you know, on the kitchen table. And he said, you're like the, you're like the, person at the end of fight club you you've sort of had to kill yourself in order to survive <laughs> it, it yeah. really it's the first time I laughed because I was like yeah that's exactly what it feels like you mentioned that the iron curtain and, and life behind the iron curtain where people didn't have the freedoms that I think some of us in the west too often take for granted today um and I think that's a very apt comparison to the kind of thing that you've been through because when I read about your story, I mentioned the Stasi earlier on. I wasn't being flippant when I mentioned them. I mean, if you think about, I mean, I think lots of people will be most familiar with the Stasi in the current era from the film, The Lives of Others, which was an incredibly successful movie and, and very accurate depiction of some of the things that happened in um, behind the Iron Curtain, particularly, obviously, in East Germany. But in that movie, you had a member of the Stasi who was spying on people in the literary world and the art world uh, by listening to their private conversations in their homes and judging by them whether they were uh, guilty of wrong think or criticizing ideas they shouldn't be criticizing or, or being critical of the authorities. And you have been through a very similar situation where you have an actual dinner party where certain things are said and it, it explodes into almost like an 
inquisitorial judgment of you as having said something or held a thought that you're not supposed to hold in the 21st century. So it's a really extraordinary example of cancel culture. But the question I wanted to ask you about that is that um, we're so often told these days that cancel culture doesn't exist, which is such a frustrating argument because it very clearly does. But in relation to the arts in particular, you've already touched on this, um, cancel culture in the arts or just a general unwillingness of people to raise certain issues or to hold certain views or to push back against certain new dogmas and certain new ideologies. Why do you think the arts world is like that? Because in most people's minds, the arts world should be a place in which you can be experimental and take risks and challenge all sorts of things that you want to challenge. But that is no longer the case, is it? No. And and, and that's been that's been quite a shock, actually. And, and, and maybe I was a bit in my own bubble. I, I, I mean, I was really getting away with it because the, the critics liked my work and, and the audiences liked my work. But but maybe I've been going I've been going against the orthodoxy for long. And I realised, actually, um, I've got quite a few theories about this because I came back to the UK in 2003 and it was quite direct. You, the money from the Arts Council or, or from arts organisations straight to the artists and there was lots of stuff going on and there was lots of kind of like incubate kind of money going around. And then gradually, gradually, I, I saw that there were more and more arts administrators, arts marketing. And that's not to say that we don't need them, but there was just like a whole new class came through of people that were doing degrees, that were getting those salaries with the pension and the holiday pay that I remember, making a lot of the decisions, huge amounts of power, but absolutely none of the risk. And I think those sort of roles have, have grown and grown and grown. Um, and, and the artist actually has become a little bit, bit weaker inside the system. And, and, and there was a sense of that the arts were starting to become a little bit more homogenised. You just started to feel you knew what the stance would be on any particular subject. And that, that was there. And I was always trying to fight against that a little bit. But that became very strong. I think then there were arguments around appropriation. So then people started to kind of be really sort of concerned that maybe they'd be accused of appropriation. So it started to get less cross-fertile and it started to get a little bit more stale and siloed. Um, and then I think came along, you know, diversity, inclusion, equality, equity. And, and, and I think all through these the past 20 years, that, that has really sort of, started to form its own culture that, that has a right and a wrong. It has a left wing and a right wing. It has certain opinions. You can also name any subject and you sort of know that people have to have opinions about all of those things that go certain ways. Um, and it's really, it's really sad. I mean, I, I don't know if audiences like that very much. I, I don't, I certainly don't like being talked down to or being told what to think, particularly not for my arts. And I think the whole point of the arts that, that whole viewpoint of like through one person trying to look at the whole world, it not quite making sense, you having to use your own, especially with dance, like I, I invite the audience to come in and watch and have to make some of their own minds up about that. that that's, that's less and less. You're being, you sit down and you're told what to think about things. Yeah. Yeah. I've, in the art that I engage with, I often get that feeling that I'm being lectured to. I mean, you, you can even go to an art gallery now and I've noticed that the little tags that they put next to artworks are getting longer and longer and longer. And it's like, you know, let me look at the art. Don't tell me what I have to think about it or what it, what the politics is or, or what the nature of the ideology is that is being explored. There is a very instructive instructional feel to a lot of contemporary art which i think is is frustrating and probably puts lots of people off um but in relation to the broader question of freedom of speech so uh, just taking it from the arts and, and taking it slightly beyond that you mentioned earlier maya for starters case where um she lost work as a consequence of her blasphemous belief in in biological sex there's also the Alison Bailey case as well of course um where she was discriminated against at her chambers because she doesn't think a, a man can become a woman um these cases are very interesting and you mentioned there that um as a consequence of the Maya Vostata case it is now a protected belief that a woman can believe that women are real and that's good in many ways and it does mean that there will be protections for 
so-called gender critical women in the workplace if they're being um, potentially punished for their views. But isn't it also kind of sad that we had to reach a situation where a woman's right to express herself had to become protected in law specifically um, because of the culture that is now swirling around, which is a culture that you've experienced at the dinner party and the fallout from it. And it's a culture that many other women have experienced as well. It's a culture that JK Rowling experiences every single day with the with the death threats and the abuse and the harassment that she receives for saying perfectly normal, perfectly legitimate things. On the one hand, those kinds of defenses of the right to express those views are welcome, of course. But on the other hand, the fact that they're necessary speaks to a far deeper problem, doesn't it, in the ability of women to express these views in a public place? Well, I I mean, it really has blown my mind that, you know, a hundred years of progress can sort of be wiped out in a sneeze, really. I mean, it is, it's like in a sneeze. And, you know, we're in danger of losing an entire generation of women and their work and their their, their ideas and their thoughts because we are, and I am, you know, you talked about cancel culture. I'm, I'm genuinely still being cancelled on a kind of like fortnightly basis and <laughs> <laughs> I shrug it off. But, you know, it, the cancel culture, it's not just, it's not just cancelling you for like your one indiscretion. It's cancelling you for all your future work, for all your livelihood, for your family, for the roof over your head. I mean, as if you should never work again or be in public yeah. again, that for me is the most, you know, sinister part, that that's it. Yeah. You're, you're, you are over, no matter what you did before, everything is wiped out. But I think I think coming back to the, the issue around particularly women, I am really worried because everybody separates it out into different things and you've got what's happening with abortion rights in the US, you've got what's happening in education in Afghanistan, you've got what's happening with women being shot Uh, for taking off the hijab in Iran. And you have this happening right now in the UK. And and all those dots are connected because these are all assaults on women's ability to participate freely in society. And this is how easy these rights can get shut down um, and women can become very scared and silenced. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that culture you describe of... Um, constant cancellation and also cancellation really meaning obliteration from the public sphere. I mean, there is this, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie describes it incredibly well in the piece she wrote, which was titled It Is Obscene, which is about um, just that new culture of just extreme intolerance and such an unforgiving climate. And she says, we're no longer human beings, we're angels trying to out angel each other and just that kind of very performative virtue which is actually incredibly cruel and is often determined to um, wipe from the public sphere anyone who's guilty of wrong thing or who doesn't 100% fall into line behind contemporary ideologies it's a really deeply unattractive political climate and cultural climate and one in which people are genuinely forbidden from saying what they want to say or very often scared of saying what they want to say because they know what the consequences will be. Um, In in relation to what people are currently scared of saying, and I think you're right to draw these things together in terms of there does seem to be a repealing of so many of the gains that were made in relation to women's rights over the past few decades from the 1910s onwards, where women in the West start to become equal members of society, there does seem to be a reversal of some of that uh, in recent years. And I think at the root of it is the fact that it is now incredibly difficult to say what a woman is. And if you can't say what a woman is, then you can't defend a woman's rights because it doesn't make any sense. So I wanted to ask you in relation to that, is that one of the reasons you think it's quite important for someone like you to say that a woman is a woman, a man is not a woman and cannot become a woman. It's important to say that not because one wants to be offensive. If people are offended by that, that's their business. But because that is actually the root of being able to stand up for someone's rights is the first starting point is to be able to define who that person is. It's quite strange when you look back at the the hansard of the uh, debate around uh, the Gender Recognition Act some of these risks were pointed out, funnily enough, by, by Neil Tepper. <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> who, who would have thought, you know, he'd be a danger of women's rights? 
And of course, you know, it goes without saying, you know, if, if somebody's suffering body dysphoria or, or believes they're trans, you know, you have the utmost empathy. It, it, it's about what this ideology, you know, means in law. Um, mm. And, you know, it's really strange to realise that there's never been an actual definition of sex. So it's a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. But what we've got at the moment is exactly, you know, particularly when it comes to sort of Roe versus Wade in America, you know, the left can't define what a woman is. But the right shut down the right of, of, of a termination, even if it's life saving, you know. And, and so women are really stuck in a pincer movement there. And so, yeah, for me, I was probably motoring under the kind of like, oh, I'm one of these sort of, I wouldn't say I was ever a lib femme, but I certainly like, you know, I, I read my, I'd read my Jermaine Greer. I'd even read Andrea Dworkin as a teenager. You know, I'd sort of pulled them off my mum's bookshelf. But then, you know, I'd still go clubbing in, you know, mini skirts and high heels. And I could, you know, I was kind of used to my own liberty and decision making. And there was always a female's perspective in my work, but I was probably one of these women in the arts that was like, you know, I want to be known as a choreographer, not as a female choreographer. And and yet now I'm like, wow, okay. I mean, that was that was just allowed to me. And that can be snapped back from you. And so women like me in the arts stand up and say, I'm not having it. Actually, and I'll get expelled. The only women that will be allowed in the arts are the women that agree with these views. Mm-hmm. The women that will say, I also agree that that trans women are women and trans men are men and 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 I don't actually my needs, which are based on biology, which are different to a man's, my needs don't matter. Sorry, but like as you get older, they really do. They really do matter. And and I know that and I would rather, you know, this is even says a bit ridiculous, but this is bigger than my career. This is bigger than just making dances. This is about the protection of young girls, particularly, and and women when they discover what it's like to have a baby and, 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 and how difficult that is. Being a woman has lifelong implications in a completely different way than being a man, biologically. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. With most providers like iTunes or Spotify, it's really easy to do with just one click. And if you get this show via YouTube, then make sure you not only subscribe to Spike's YouTube channel, but that you also click the bell so that you are alerted to every new episode. I think the um, the point you make about, on the one hand, we have a left that seems incapable of defining what a woman is and will come down like a ton of bricks on anyone who does give a biological definition of what a woman is. And then on the other hand, we have a right wing, especially in the US, which is gunning for women's rights, which does understand what a woman is and would rather that they were back in the kitchen or suddenly not um, taking control of their reproductive choices. And as you say, it's an extraordinary pincer movement in in relation to what's going on with women at the moment. But I specifically wanted to ask you about the problem of the left, because the left traditionally, I'm old enough to remember when the left was fairly progressive. That seems to be a long time ago now. Um, But they certainly knew what a woman is, and they certainly knew that women's rights were important. Now we have a Labour Party where the leader is not even capable of giving a straight answer to the question, can a woman have a penis? Other MPs in the Labour Party openly say, yes, a woman can have a penis. And it's an extraordinary state of of affairs, firstly, because you think if if they will lie about something like that, what else will they lie about? So there's that fundamental question. But also, uh, what does that mean about women's relationship with the left? And especially for progressive women, maybe women in the arts or women who generally think of themselves as liberal, open-minded, leftish. Where are they meant to go now if we have parties of the left which don't even know what a woman is and often treat with contempt any woman who does say what a woman is? Well, yes, I, I was really lucky enough to have um, lunch with Rosie Duffield um, a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And and I, I think she's actually come coming through the other side of this and, and, and she's like, we don't need to be polite and calm about this. We, we can be angry because, you know, being polite and nice about it is yet another way for them to kind of control you. Like we're, we're allowed to be absolutely furious and I, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, I think it's really, really strange what's happening with the left and the sort of, the, the, the blindness to their own history is also what's very sad and the role of women in the union movement and uh, the Labour Party 
just also being completely wiped out. I mean, they just clearly don't think that it's a vote winner, I guess. I guess they think they'd rather have the youth vote than the vote of half the population. And I think at the moment, it has left women in a really, really tricky place. And so we're, you know, um, monitoring everything that every politician says about this subject matter. And so Kemi Bandernock has come out, you know, it's quite quite a heroine um, around her stance on this one and one and only issue. And we may well disagree on many other things. And so Eva Baverman, as the Attorney General, uh, put out some really good, clear guidance about uh, children, which, you know, on mum's net, it's like, that's fantastic. Do we agree with her on immigration? No, no, of course we don't. Mm. So, so you know, where where are we? Are we going to be single issue voters? I think this is of such importance that lots of women will decide that. And other women that don't know what to do, I think will be spoiling their ballots, which goes against, you know, our, our desire to want to participate in democracy. So it's it's a difficult place, yeah. Okay, a couple more questions. I wanted to, you mentioned there about the earlier on about the protection of girls. And I did want to ask you about that because it does strike me that I think lots of people haven't thought through the consequences of this ideology and of this culture for girls and for girls who are either young or entering into womanhood. If they're growing up in a world in which there is so much public commentary about the fact that women aren't even real and anyone can become a woman. It's such a flimsy thing to be that Eddie Izzard, for example, can click his fingers one day and be a man and click his fingers the next day and be a woman. That's how meaningless womanhood is. I mean, that is essentially the message that is continually communicated by this idea that someone literally becomes a woman simply by declaring himself as such. It really does give an impression of womanhood as a a meaningless social biological category. And you do think about the impact that has on girls who are becoming women and, and their sense of self and and their sense of who they are in the world. But also even more broadly is the question of whether girls will have their own toilets at school and their own changing rooms and their own ability to take part in sports. And we have heroines like Sharon Davis, who's doing a great job of trying to defend sports for girls and for women. To me, anyway, there's an obviously corrosive impact of all of this stuff, but other people seem incapable of seeing it. How do you think it, we might get through to people to explain to them the dilemmas this ideology poses for girls and for girls who are entering into womanhood? Well, you're right, because the whole uh, transgender ideology depends on stereotypes. So if you're going to identify as a girl, that means you like pink, you have long hair, you want to wear dresses, you want to wear makeup, have your nails done and giggle. And, you know, I'm sorry, at the, at the harder edge of that, you are a sexual object. Um, yeah. What young girl would want to say, yes, I want to be a cis woman and I identify as a cis woman when they could identify out of it and say, do you know what, I'm, maybe I'm actually a, a trans man, maybe I'm male. And then that, that's a get out card from all of those stereotypes and all of that objectification. Now, there are routes that go with the, you know, I, I was studying um, eating disorders at University of Oxford and using dance to kind of eliminate this quite severe mental health issue that also is inside, you know, the body. And there is nothing more difficult than a female body going through puberty and the way that your body changes and the way you know, it's kind of what Virginia Woolf looks at in Orlando. It's the way the outside, you go from being a person who is an agent in the world and free to do what you like and think about things and, and scamper about, suddenly the entire male gaze is upon you and you no longer in an agent, you are, you are an object. You might be the same, but nobody treats you the same. And you start to turn that in on yourself and your own body And it's only when, I think, when women reach their sort of late 20s, 30s, do they sort of calm down and go, blimey, got got through that. But that was pretty scathing. I mean, the the experiences of going through puberty, of starting with periods of toilets, it is such such a complete nightmare, even thinking back with, you know, single-sex toilets were, you know, completely normal when, when I was a teenager. You know, to be to be going through that with teenage boys involved, it's an absolute mm. horror. And I think sports, you're right, is one of the clearest areas where we can see what the difference 
testosterone does to bodies. We can see that difference and to deny it. It, it's it's clear to the to the eye, and I think sports and and the amazing women from sports that are really fighting. I think that that's the clearest example where you just go, that's not fair. That's not fair. Yeah, uh, I I agree completely. And um, having been a teenage boy, I find the prospect of allowing teenage boys into girls' areas is just so. I mean, most of the time, just because they're a bit stupid and idiotic and and behave in a in a sometimes reckless childish way um and that's not what girls want if they're having particular issues or need some privacy so i just find it an extraordinary idea um rosie the final thing i wanted to ask you is uh, whether there's an optimistic element to your story so you talked about obviously you went through something quite extraordinary you there's still the um juggernaut of cancellation that some people would like to send in your direction but at the same time, it does seem to me that you've also developed new networks and connections and a sense of solidarity with lots of the other women and men who are speaking out on this issue or speaking out for freedom of speech more broadly and, and against cancel culture and the right of people wherever they work, in the arts or anywhere else, to hold certain views and express them freely without being punished or discriminated against or sacked. Um, has that helped you over the past year in relation to the transformation that you've been through that the fact that there are there is now a growing movement of sorts isn't there where women in particular but also lots of men offering their solidarity are coming together particularly in the uk i think more than many other countries in the west to start raising questions and to start saying look we have the right to define ourselves and we have the right to speak freely it's kind of where where the really funny cool people are right now i mean that is <laughs> that is like the best thing and and you know i've got this network um i, I really was in my bubble uh, it, you know and, and it was it was great but having this debate this is a real thing that's happening and being in it and being able to talk with such you know brilliant minds and it's, it's where the humour is. I mean, none of this movement has any humour. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I, I do, I, I honestly do think this is this is the place where we're going to fight it. It's in the UK. We, I was at a conference on freedom of speech way back in January, which seems like another world ago. And this had only just happened to me. And there was a delegate from Japan and um, we sort of met and then we talked in the tea break. And he said something really funny. He said, he said you are such a, difficult country aren't you you argue with each other you argue with your politicians you 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 <laughs> you won't stop arguing but he said it's very interesting you you really fight for things and the rest of the world watches you and i think that's right you know the feminists that have come up through the labor party through the union movement that there are women from the conservative party women from all across the board coming together to to speak you know, it, it, it's incredible. We're, we're good at grassroots and we're good at activism and, and we're probably a bit stubborn. We should be stubborn about our rights. You know, they are easily lost and very hard to get back. So we've got to fight this. Yeah. Rosie Kay, thank you very much.